I am blessed to be here this morning, blessed to serve at the request of my friend Anthony. You have a blessed pastor here, so thank you for allowing me to bring God's Word to you this morning. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to spend the majority of our time this morning in the first few chapters of the book of Genesis. The sermon title, uh, Restoring Joy in the Mundane. Restoring Joy in the Mundane. Uh, Subtitle, Recovering the Cultural Mandate. And we're going to spend most of our time this morning studying the cultural mandate with the outcome that you're better equipped to have joy in what is the seemingly mundane. Now, I will tell you in advance, uh, my, in one sense, goal is to leave you this morning past the saturation point. We're going to look at a lot of scripture, and by the time we're done, I don't think you'll be able to retain any more information. Uh, But, as most of you, I'm sure, know, the sermons are online so that you'll have the opportunity to go back and and re-listen. So I don't know if you're a note taker or or not, but uh, we will probably exceed your ability to take notes. Your hand will probably be cramped. And so just a, a little bit of warning. There's a sense in which what I'm hoping to do is really a bit of a paradigm shift in your thinking about the Christian life. That's a lofty goal, and that might even raise some yellow or even red flags. You hear a preacher talking about a paradigm shift in how you think about the Christian life. That's a pretty big claim. And so I'm blessed to know that Anthony will uh, follow up after I'm done. So, uh, again, restoring joy in the mundane. And I know that Uh, All of us as Christians who've been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, who are waiting for His return, who love to gather with God's people, we do struggle with having joy in the monotonous, ongoing little things of life. And we read scriptures that speak of uh, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of Christ. And we wonder, can I really do all things to the glory of Christ? Can I patch a hole in the wall to the glory of Christ? Can I paint my garage? Can I fold laundry? Can I organize files? Can I flip on a light switch or walk down the sidewalk to the glory of Christ? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Absolutely you can. So you've turned in your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 1. And before we dig into the text too much, let me just give you a little bit of an outline of where we're going to go this morning. First, we're going to begin with defining the cultural mandate and its relationship to the image of God. So the cultural mandate and the image of God. And I'll tell you now, as you hear the words cultural mandate, I'll explain that more. It's very similar to another concept you might know of, the creation mandate or the dominion mandate. So, step one, define the cultural mandate and the image of God. Step two is going to be to confirm the ongoing validity of the cultural mandate, the ongoing validity of it for today. And these first two steps are very important because... A failure to understand the cultural mandate and a failure to understand its ongoing validity today is in large part, I think, part of what prohibits us from having joy in the mundane. Our third step, this is where we'll spend most of our time, is illustrating the fulfillment of the cultural mandate. And we're going to see that in Genesis 4. Genesis 4, we'll spend a fair amount of time there. And then finally... Finally, as we are uh, New Testament Christians, we're going to look for just a moment at the Great Commission and come to understand how it is that the Great Commission subsumes the cultural mandate. The Great Commission subsumes the cultural mandate. I think sometimes we get the wrong idea about the Great Commission and we end up with this idea that if I'm not out on the mission field or intentionally sharing the gospel with somebody, then I'm not really doing spiritual things and I'm kind of not fulfilling God's purpose and role for me on earth. And I, I think we can correct that thinking just a little bit. 
So uh, let's begin. We're going to define the cultural mandate. We're going to see it here in Genesis chapter 1. I want to reread some of what Pastor Anthony has read, verse 26, 27, and 28. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, so that they will have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that creeps on the earth. It is here in this text that we find the cultural mandate. Now you do see the word dominion, verse 28, in part of the blessing, have dominion over the fish, the birds, every living thing. But when we talk about the cultural mandate, what we're talking about is really earlier in verse 28. You see there, God blessed them, said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Fill the earth. And at first glance, you would think fill the earth just refers to people. And that's not entirely wrong. It's it's correct. We are to fill the earth with people. But there's more than that. This has to do with filling the earth with culture. And we'll define that maybe in a little bit. But this is about filling the earth with culture, with products that man draws out of creation and uses for the glory of God and reflects the glory of God. Why do I say that? Well, this word for fill shows up again in Genesis 6. So if you just want to jump ahead to Genesis 6 for a moment, the next time we hear of the earth being filled, it's not so much people that the earth is filled with. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 11, we read, Now the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. The idea is that we are to fill the earth. And the earth, in fact, got filled before the flood, but it wasn't with God-glorifying culture. It wasn't with the culture of life. It was with the culture of death. As a result of the fall, the earth was filled with violence. And as we read through the rest of Scripture, we see that this concept of the earth being filled comes up multiple times in Isaiah 11. There's reference to the whole earth being filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. We see the same thing in Habakkuk 2, that the whole earth will, in fact, one day be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And so this this benediction to fill the earth speaks of filling the earth with culture. And I want you to notice back in Genesis 1, I know you've turned over to 6, go back to 1 for just a moment. You have to understand the imago Dei, the image of God. We hear a lot of talk about the image of God, and rightfully so. Because of the image of God, we know of the sanctity of human life. We look at the sanctity of human life as it relates to uh, the issue of the American Holocaust, uh, abortion. Uh, the, the murder of, of the innocent by the number of tens of millions. And we, we, we strive against that, that culture of death by pointing out that man has intrinsic value because he's made in the image of God and all that is true. However, in one sense, that misses the point. The, the intrinsic value of man is a secondary point to the image of God. The primary point to the image of God is found right in the text of 126. And I am reading from the Legacy Standard Bible, and they do a great job of drawing out what the text is communicating. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, so that... You see that language there. So that there is a purpose in being made in the image of God according to God's likeness. What is the purpose? That they will have dominion. So the reason we're made in the image of God is to carry out the cultural mandate. 
Yes, we have intrinsic value, and yes, we should defend human life and the sanctity of life. But that's a side point. The primary point from Genesis is that we were created in the image of God for the explicit purpose of filling the earth with God-glorifying culture. That's why we were made in the image of God. And I could just give you a couple quotes to help you see some, some other thinkers on this topic. Now, some of you will be familiar with a uh, systematic theology textbook uh, by uh, Pastor John MacArthur and Dick Mayhew. They did a systematic theology book. I refer to it as the, the White Whale. It's a big white book called Biblical Doctrine. But listen to what's written there. Human culture has roots in Genesis 1 through 2. The command for man to rule and subdue the earth and its creatures is often referred to as the cultural mandate, since man was to use his abilities and status as God's image bearer to control the creation on God's behalf. This included the land, vegetation, animals, birds, and aquatic creatures. And In Genesis 2.15, God put Adam in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Man was given an earthly vocation in this created culture. Culture includes works, art, music, education, and all areas where man interacts with his environment. God is the creator of culture, and man is called to carry it out, that's the cultural mandate, on God's behalf. So this isn't a, a concept that I have made up. This is a concept that theologians have long since recognized. And as a matter of fact, in the, later in that same section of the book, uh, the authors write, in sum, God created culture. He made a diverse world and tasked man to rule and subdue it for his glory. There is no dichotomy between God and culture or man and culture. God expects man to successfully rule over his creation, although the complete fulfillment of this expectation awaits Jesus' kingdom in the world to come. What you should draw out of that that textbook definition, then, is the ongoing nature of the cultural mandate. Uh, they wrote that God expects man to successfully rule over his creation, although the complete fulfillment of this expectation awaits Jesus' kingdom in the world to come. So having kind of defined the cultural mandate and seen it from the text, I want to kind of move to confirming the ongoing validity of the cultural mandate, that you and I are to be carrying it out today. And to do that, I have a couple places I want to look. We already hinted at it from the, the text from the Bible Doctrine book. But we could go back to the Westminster uh, Confession. Many of you are familiar with the Westminster Confession, and in particular, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Um, uh, There's a, uh, one of the Puritans, John Flavel, he wrote a commentary on the Shorter Catechism. And in question one, which many of you know, what is the chief end of man? Now, the answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Well, Flavel has a commentary on that question. And this is what he asks. And remember, this is hundreds of years ago. He says, seeing a chief, that is a chief end, seeing that there's a chief end of man, seeing a chief supposes an inferior end. What is that inferior end for which man was made? He's saying, since there is a chief end, what are, the, what are the inferior ends that we employ to finish that chief end? And here's how he answers it. It is prudently, soberly, and mercifully to govern, use, and dispose of other creatures in the earth, sea, and air over which God gave man the dominion. And then he cites Genesis 1.26, the text we've already read. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let him have dominion. And then he adds in Psalm 8. You have made him, speaking of man, to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put, him, put all things under his feet. So whether it's uh, the MacArthur book that gives us the ongoing expectation of the mandate or whether we go back hundreds of years to this exposition of the shorter catechism, we see that men in church history have understood the ongoing nature of this mandate. But we want to ground our argument in Scripture. So just turn over to Genesis 9 because some will come along and say, yeah, you know, that mandate was before the fall. 
That was before the fall. After the fall, that ruined everything. Or that mandate was before the flood. Now we have a new creation post-flood. Okay, well, Genesis 9 is after the earth is filled with violence. God has washed the earth, so to speak, with a flood, and he's hit restart with Noah and his sons. And in 9 1, what do we read? God blessed Noah and his sons and said, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. There it is, restated post fall, post flood for our time period. So, the ongoing nature then of this cultural mandate. So, not only is it pre fall, it's also post fall, post flood. But here's where it really gets fun. Go to Gen- I'm sorry. Go to Revelation 21. It's not only pre fall and post fall. This extends all the way into the eternal state. And this is a really important por- portion of scripture because when we when we fail to realize what eternity is going to be like, we fail to realize what we should be doing now. So, in Revelation 21 and 22, you're turning to 21, uh, the Apostle John has shown the new heavens and the new earth. In Revelation 21, verse 10, John says, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and He showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. If we skip down, verse 22, I saw no sanctuary in it, for the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb are its sanctuary. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And pay attention to verses 24 through 26. And the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. The gates will never be closed by day, for there will be no night there. And they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Have you realized that in the eternal state, there will still be nations? Distinct nations. There will still be kings. It's very clear in the text. There's nations and there's kings of the earth. Verse 24. And those kings bring their glory. That's the glory of the nations. The kings bring the glory of the nations into Jerusalem. So nations are not a product of the fall. They're not something sinful. They're actually good. And human government, civil government, is not a product of the fall. It's actually good. It's going to continue in the eternal state. In the eternal state, there's going to be civil government and nations. But our particular focus is on the fact that they bring their glory, the the glory of the nations into Jerusalem. What we're talking about is the culture, the culture that is being made, the cultural products being made in the new heavens and the new earth. When God creates, recreates this earth and the curse is removed and creation no longer fights against us, when we start to employ uh, the utilization of technology to draw out of this earth and to make beautiful things, we will bring those things to God in worship. That's what's going to happen in the eternal state. So there's a sense in which what we're doing now is preparation for what we're going to do in eternity. So yes, uh, nowadays when we have kings, so often they rule unrighteously. But the fact of human government isn't a product of the fall. Uh, If we want to narrow it down, we might just say that the bearing of the sword is one of the roles of civil government. That's a product of the fall. But listen again to what uh, is found in the, the MacArthur and Mayhew biblical doctrine. In another section they write, pertaining to this particular text, Um, They're speaking of what's going to happen at the end and in the book of Revelation. And they say, even the eternal state will possess the best of human culture as the nations and kings of the earth bring their glory into New Jerusalem. This glory probably refers to the cultural contributions from the nations. All the culture during this time will exist for the glory of God. And its headquarters will be the new Jerusalem made of pure gold and precious jewels. 
So we see then what the cultural mandate is. It's tie to the image of God. We see that it was a, a mandate before the fall, after the fall, after the flood, and man is still going to carry it out in the eternal state. Now, obviously the implication is that we are to carry out the cultural mandate today. And the fact of the matter is we are. We do carry out the cultural mandate. All of us do it whether we realize it or not. We're engaged in doing this very thing, and we'll get to that in a moment. But I want to move on to the really the third part of this message, which is illustrating the fulfillment of the cultural mandate. Illustrating the fulfillment. And that comes in two parts. The first part, we're going to go back into Genesis, and we'll be here for a while. So if you want to go back into Genesis 1, the first part is to lay the foundation, as it were, for where do these materials, we might say, come from. And then we'll see the materials being used. So as we go into Genesis 1, what we find is that God has made his creation uh, a very organ in a very organized way. And he gives us a taxonomy. A taxonomy is a way of, of categorizing different things, organizing them into different categories. And what we find, uh, what God has done here is shown us that he is a logical God. And he breaks things into categories for us to study. And a lot of this, I'm not going to show you anything new because there's nothing... There's nothing new under the sun. What I, the, may, the way you might think about this is I've always wanted to go on one of those Grand Canyon tours where you float down the Grand Canyon and you go with somebody uh, like Answers in Genesis where they provide a geologist to point out to you the, the layers and layers of sediment and explain to you, oh, this layer was laid down, then this layer, and look, there's fossils over there. They're not putting anything new into the ground. They're helping you to see what's already there. And that's kind of how I'm going to function. I'm going to be your guide in Genesis to help you see what's already here that you might have just passed by and never noticed. So even look at the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's a taxonomy, right? The earth, that's geology. That's our study of geology. And then the heavens, we've got meteorology and astronomy, right? I didn't say astrology, astronomy. So we've got geology and meteorology and astronomy. And then we can break this down into more categories of creation. Chapter 1, verse 10. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. Now we've got geology contrasted with oceanography. We've got earth and we've got seas. How about verse 11? Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with their seed in them. So within the realm of geology, study of the earth, we've got biology, the study of life. And here in particular, we've got botany. That's the, the study of the plant life. And then we can focus it down even more because the text does dendrology. Dendrology is the study of woody plants and shrubs and trees, and it's right there in the text. Let the earth sprout vegetation and plants yielding seed. And then it speaks of fruits. That's, the, that's palmology. So God is telling us, hey, you can do palmology, dendrology, all under the categories of botany, under the category of uh, biology. You go to verse 14. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and days and years. Uh, verse 16, God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and also the stars. Now we're into astronomy. We are to study these things. Remember, they are for signs. We can skip to verse 20. God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth and the face of the expanse of the heavens. Now we get into zoology. We, uh, it's a subcategory then of biology. We get zoology. Well, the waters, we've got aquatic biology. We can study what's in the freshwater. We've got marine biology, the saltwater uh, life. Here we have mention of fish. That's ichthyology. God is delineating for us all these different categories of what he's made that's distinct and different from the others. Uh, there's birds in the expanse. That's ornithology. You might have heard people say, yeah, you know, Genesis isn't a science book. Well, that's true, but it's got an awful lot of sciences mentioned in it. It's full of sciences. Uh, look at verse 22. 
And that's where God blesses them. Uh, that's what he just made, these great sea monsters of verse 21, and the fish and the birds. Verse 22, be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters in the seas. And they just do it. Whenever God blesses them to do something, they just naturally do it. You can go on to verse 24. We move to mammology. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. Cattle, creeping things, beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. So we got mammology. We got entomology. That's the insect world. We got herpetology. That's amphibians and reptiles and everybody's favorite. Arachnology, spiders and arachnids. All these different categories that God has made for us to, to study and have dominion over and to utilize. And finally, we reach the pinnacle Verse 26, anthropology, the study of man. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness so that they will have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that creeps on the earth. And so here we get to our anthropology that man and woman made equal in essence in the image of God for the explicit purpose of filling the earth with culture and having dominion over all that God has made. And so we can see here that all these different categories of study. Well, what I want to do is, is focus in a little bit tighter because there, there is more. In chapter 2, we move on and we learn a little bit more about anthropology. Uh, chapter 2, verse 7, Then Yahweh God formed man from the dust of the ground, from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man's created differently. Everything else, God just spoke it. And it existed. Here, God actually takes dust and creates man and then breathes life into him. Go to verse 8. Yahweh planted a garden in Eden. Now we've got two locations here. Two different locations. So the garden is in Eden, right? So it's like a park inside of a city. Uh, Eden is the city and then there's a garden. And this brings us then to the study of horticulture. Horticulture, uh, the science and art of gardening. And God created it. God created horticulture. And he put man in the garden for the purpose of learning horticulture. And in verse 9, the study of botany and ethnobotany. Uh, look with me at verse 9. Out of the ground, Yahweh God caused to grow every tree that is desirable in appearance and good for food. Uh, two more categories here. Number one, aesthetics. God chose, or eh, that's a good way to say it, I guess, He chose which trees are the ones that are desirable in appearance. This is the study of beauty. And what we see here is that a be the beauty is objective. It's objective. It's not subjective. Uh, when we say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, that's partly true. The beholder's God. And God de determined which of his creation was desirable in appearance. And what's fascinating, you can Google these terms at another time, golden ratios and Fibonacci sequences. What we've discovered as we study creation is that things that are aesthetically pleasing to the eye are normally always uh, tied to either Fibonacci sequences, so you think of the, the seashell that spirals. There's a mathematical equation that you can plug into a computer and it will create that beautiful picture. There's also the golden ratios. And so when you study some of the most famous works of art, Da Vinci's or Dali's, a lot of times these, these these works of art utilize golden ratios. So do a lot of our famous architecture. When you see architecture that's been preserved and it's beautiful, it's because they've utilized golden ratios. Man has observed what God made, objective beauty, and then replicated it. 
But not only is there this, uh, this ethnobotany, where uh, ethnobotany is the study of human relationships with, uh, with botany, the, its, its usage and its utilization for food and medicine and tools and decorations. So not only then do we have aesthetics, but we also have food, right? And we, we know that. There's not only the trees that are desirable, desirable in appearance, but also those good for food. And as we mentioned earlier, palmology, that's the study of fruits. And so Adam and Eve would be in the garden and they'd be able to taste all of these different fruits and, and notice the differences in flavors and textures. <clears throat> then we move on to verse 10. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And that makes sense. Gardens need water. And so there's a river, and it goes out, and it waters the garden. And from there it divided and became four rivers. Well, we got some more studies we can do. We can study potomology. That's the study of rivers. If you just want to study rivers, you study potomology. Also here, we have the study of hydrology. Because if you're going to utilize water for the garden then hydrology is particularly studying the distribution and management of water. And as some of you this morning probably crossed over one of the washes where all the rain collects and then it gets washed out into the ocean. Not a very useful way to collect rainwater. But this is what Adam and Eve were to do. They were to study this usage of water. And as these rivers go out, they go into four more rivers. It splits. And look at what you have in verse 11 and 12. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that went around the whole land of Havilah where there's gold. Now the gold of that land is good. And the bedellium and the onyx stone are there. Why do we need to know that? So what? Why did the Spirit of God have Moses write this information down? Because it's part of the cultural mandate. When we talk about gold and bdellium and onyx stone, we're talking about petrology and mineralogy and gemology. All these things that we're to use to worship God. Adam and Eve would go and they'd walk along these rivers, and as they would dig, they would discover these precious things in the ground, and then they would use them for the worship of God. You think about when God would have Israel create the tabernacle. And, and the, the high priest, he would wear jewels on his breastplate. And so many things would be made out of gold. All of these things that God put into the earth, he expected man to draw out of the earth and use them as worship. And we call that culture. And so the, the picture here, the picture here is it culminates in verse 15. Yahweh God took the man, set him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The picture is that God puts man and woman into the garden. He's given them a template. Here's objective beauty. Here's food. Here's, here's an irrigation system. Here's things with, with seeds in them that will self-replicate. And these rivers go out across the earth. Now what you're to do is go and expand the garden. Go out and copy the template I've given you. Go out and follow these rivers, dig materials out of it, dig resources out of it, create irrigation in canals, and turn this whole earth into this beautiful garden. Subdue it. And use the animals. You want to harness them, whatever you want to do, harness what I've made and use it for my glory. That's what man was supposed to do. And we know the fall came in and made that a lot more difficult. So that lays the foundation for the carrying out of the cultural mandate that I told you we were going to watch it actually play out. We were going to illustrate it, and that's what we're going to do next. And it's right here in the text. We're going to go to Genesis 4. It's fascinating that God actually spends the time to show us the carrying out of the cultural mandate. It's right there in the text. I just need to point it out to you. I don't have to jump through any hoops or do any uh, hermeneutical gymnastics to make this work. It's just right there in the text. Uh, by way of reminder at this point, the fall has taken place in Genesis 3. And what God has revealed in 3.15 is that there's two lines of people. There's the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. They're at enmity to one another. So all of humanity breaks into these two, these two lines, these two seeds. And what we're going to see in Genesis 4 is Cain's line, the fallen line, 
carrying out the cultural mandate. And this is going to cover a period of somewhere about five to seven hundred years. And you think about what's happened since the Protestant Reformation. We just celebrated the 500th anniversary a couple years ago. And you think about all that's changed in 500 years when there was no printing press and then all the technology we have now. It was about five to 700 years in what we're going to look at. It doesn't tell us that in Genesis 4, but in Genesis 5, we get a, another lineage. So Genesis 4, Genesis 5 give us parallel lineages. Cain's line, Seth's line. Genesis 5 has Seth's line, and it tells us how long people live and how old they are when they have kids. And so in Genesis 5, as you trace these seven generations, it's uh, almost 700 years. And so if you, if you take those numbers and bring them back into Genesis 4 with Cain's line and seven generations, it's probably five to 700 years. That's how much is contained here uh, time-wise. So let's jump in and take a look at the carrying out of the cultural mandate. We know that Cain has murdered his brother. Cain is of the evil one, John tells us, 1 John 3.12. And then we get Cain's line, verse 16, 4.16. Cain went out from the presence of Yahweh and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Then Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he, that's Cain, built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. Well, what we have here then is the beginning of urbanization, the first city. We, we call it urbanization. Uh, this is where man starts to draw out of the earth material resources and create it for dwelling places. He's, he's forming what God has made into something new. And it, it looks like what actually happens is um, because of the, the verb that's used here, the aspect of the verb, it's not that he built a city, it's that he was building a city. He wasn't able to complete it, so he passes it on to his son, Enoch, and then the city is named Enoch. He normally names cities after their rulers. And so Enoch is the ruler of the city because Cain was supposed to be a vagrant and a wanderer, so it appears God doesn't let him fulfill this plan. But he starts the process of urbanization. That's verse 17. Now we get Enoch, and in verse 18, we're going to cover hundreds of years with just these generations in one verse. To Enoch was born Erad. And Er in uh, Hebrew is the word for city. So he's thinking about cities. He names his son a derivative of city. Enoch was born Erad, and Erad was the father of Mahuyael. Mahuyael was the father of Methushael. Methushael was the father of Lamech. And God spends a lot of time telling us about Lamech. He spends a lot of time telling us about Lamech. Uh, we have, I think it's six verses about him from 19 all the way to 24. Six verses. And so let's kind of dig in just a little bit here. Verse, uh, we'll start in 19. Lamech took for himself two wives. Now this word took we haven't heard it in a few chapters. Last time we heard this word is when Eve took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Lamech took two wives, not what you're supposed to do. And follow the, the logic here in this agrarian culture. The more wives you have, the more kids you can have. The more kids you can have, the more labor you have. The more labor you have, the more product you have. And the more product you have, the more wealth you have. Lamech is empire building. This is the reason for multiple wives. He doesn't have a wife and a concubine, a wife and a mistress. He has two families, essentially, because that multiplies the labor, it multiplies the output, and therefore multiplies the wealth. Lamech is a very, very intelligent man, though evil. And we learn, it's interesting, the text turns away from Lamech and traces his children. He took two wives. One of them, verse 20, her name was Ada, and she gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and have livestock. And when you stop and you think about what this is communicating, it's fascinating. 
So uh, they live in tents and they have livestock. Now, back in chapter 4, we know that Cain, it tells us, 4-2, Cain was a cultivator of the ground. So we already have farming. And Abel was a keeper of flocks. That would be like small animals, sheep, uh, goats. But here, now we have some specialized uh, professional ranching. These are professional ranchers. These are big, not not game, but livestock. We understand that word. And so uh, this, this son, Ada, he's the father of those who live in tents and have livestock. He's got giant flocks of livestock, and they eat so much that the men have to live in tents to be nomadic to keep them fed. They have to keep traveling to keep these animals fed. These are the first professional ranchers. And you think about how how highly specialized this would have to be. Think about the specialization of breeding these animals, feeding these animals, uh, the logistics of moving them around, the logistics of making tents, repairing those tents. These are highly specialized trades that are developing as man carries out the cultural mandate. They look at the animals, they look at the things in the earth, and they convert it uh, into products that are usable and an incredible amount of of work and wisdom. Now we have another brother, and he's carrying out the cultural mandate, as we all do. Verse 21, the other brother, his name is Jubal. He's very, very different. He's very different. He's the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. And so you can just imagine the difference between a, a guy who invents musical instruments and a guy who's out being a, a, a rancher. Two probably different personality types, two different lifestyle types. But what's fascinating here, Jubal, when you consider what's going on, the first one, the lyre, is a stringed instrument. He's the father of all those who play stringed instruments. He has studied harmonics. He studied harmonics, and then he's used things in the earth and converted uh, converted these products into musical instruments with strings by utilizing harmonics. He's carrying out the cultural mandate, and also the pipe. Now, the pipe would be a, a reed instrument, so he's harnessing wind to create sound. Then we have another child of Lamech. He's the half-brother from the other wife. Verse 22, Zillah, the other wife, she gave birth to Tubal Cain. He is the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. Now, this word for forger has the idea generally of a smith, a blacksmith. So he is going into the earth. Uh, And they're drawing out these metals, these materials, and he's converting them into tools. And really, the word forger really even has the better idea of a sharpener. He's taking bronze and iron, and you remember the minerals that were in the rivers? Remember there was gold? He's, He's been going out, he's been recovering all these materials, and he's sharpening them into tools and probably weapons. That's probably what he's developing. So culture is just exploding. Weapons, tools, stringed instruments, musical instruments, tents, cities, uh, shepherding, ranching. This is all within five to 700 years. Man is carrying out the cultural mandate. All these specialized vocations. And then we come back to Lamech. And Lamech is a, Lamech is a bad dude. He's the pinnacle example of an ungodly culture. And uh, some people speculate as to why the text is in the order that it is. We had Lamech, then we had his kids, then back to Lamech. Why give us his kids first and their accomplishments? Well, let's read verse 23 and we'll answer that question. And you should note, I suspect your Bible has verse 23 indented, kind of like in the Psalms. It's indented because this is a psalm. This is, in, this is Hebrew poetry. He wrote a song. Lamech might be the, he might be the originator of gangster rap. He writes a song about murder and vengeance. Read it. 
Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, give ear to my word, for I've killed a man for striking me, a boy for wounding me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. This is a vicious man. He writes a song about murdering somebody. And I think it's quite reasonable to think that he probably used one of his kids' musical instruments. He walks in. He's got one of his son's metal instruments that he just used to kill somebody. Then he takes up the other son's musical instruments, and he calls the wives in and says, Hey, come listen to this little ditty. And then sings a song about murdering somebody. This is the cultural mandate being carried out by the ungodly. And God takes the time to show us what it looked like. He didn't need to include all of this in the text of Genesis, but he wants us to see that man does carry out this mandate. Man does go out into the earth, and we naturally, whether it's animals, whether it's natural resources, whether it's the harnessing of the laws of nature, we do, in fact, carry out the cultural mandate. It's what we're supposed to do. All mankind does it. And if you're still not convinced, all you have to do is just look at children. Many of you have raised little children, and what you'll notice, little children, they have an insatiable desire to create and to build and to construct and to color and to sketch and to to beautify. They just naturally do it. Give them blocks or give them crayons, and they're set. They can't help but do it because that's what they were designed to do by God. Now, children, they don't do it to the glory of the Father. They do it to the glory of their spiritual father, which, as we all know, is Satan. And we we then hope for the regeneration, pray for the regeneration of our children. But all of mankind is carrying out the cultural mandate. And that's exactly what you were doing when Christ saved you. Whether you realized it or not, whether you were intentional about it or not, You, in fact, were carrying out the cultural mandate when Christ saved you. You are participating in art and in music and in technology and in building and constructing and organizing things, specialized vocations. You were carrying out the cultural mandate, whether you realized it or not. But you were doing it to the glory of your spiritual father, Satan, as Ephesians 2 would tell us. The, The unbeliever walks according to the power of the ruler of this world, the power of the air, the ruler of the air in Ephesians 2. And we've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved Son. So you were carrying out that mandate in the kingdom of darkness under the spiritual power of Satan. And Christ has come along and He's set you free. And now, in Christ, you have the opportunity to do what you're supposed to do for the glory of God. You have the opportunity, even as we sang about this morning in some of those songs, all creation sings. I pray that you have been rescued by Christ. I should never assume that everybody in a church building has in fact been rescued by Christ. I pray that you do know the gospel, and I'm thankful that Pastor Anthony is a faithful gospel preacher, and that if you come here to this church, you'll hear the gospel. And so let me then remind you of the gospel, that each and every one of us were by nature children of wrath. Right? You don't have to teach children to snatch a toy from another little toy, or to bite another little kid, or say, mine, or to disobey their parents. It comes naturally to them, because we are by nature sinners. And we are by nature then alienated from God, hostile to God. Oh, we like the things that God can provide. We like the gifts of God. We like the creation of God. We just don't like the God of creation. And so we're sinners. And why do we sin? Because we're sinners. right? We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners by nature. And that's a problem since God's standard is perfection. And He's created a hell for all rebels. He's created that hell for all rebels, which you and I all were. And the plan from all of eternity was that God the Son would come down and live a perfect life. He'd carry out the cultural mandate. We don't know what he was doing for those full 30 years, but he wasn't sitting around twiddling his thumbs. He kept the law perfectly without ever sinning. And then he went to the cross, and on the cross, he bore the wrath of God for everyone who would ever believe upon him. Everyone who would ever believe upon him would have their sins paid. 
because we can't pay for our own sins. We can start the payment in hell, but the payment will never be fully made, and that's why hell is eternal. But the God-man can complete the payment because he is eternal, and he did complete the payment. And so the good news of the gospel is that every person who comes to Christ, who turns away from their sin and their unbelief and turns to Christ in faith, full faith, that he alone is the way to have your sins paid for. He alone is the way to have the righteousness God requires. Coming to Christ, you can be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Everybody who comes to Christ will be saved. And then we get the opportunity to be ambassadors of Christ. Think about how fascinating that is. We who were rebels, who served in the kingdom of darkness quite contentedly, we served in the kingdom of darkness, we get commissioned by the king to go out and proclaim the king is coming back. He is, in fact, coming back. And when he comes, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whether that's because your knee is smashed and your tongue is forced, Every tongue is going to confess. But here's the deal. The king has sent me in advance of him. And he's offering you terms of peace. Terms of surrender. Incredible terms. If you will turn from your rebellion, not only will this king forgive you, he'll adopt you into his family. And you'll be a co-inheritor of all that he has. He'll forgive you. He'll bring you into his family. And he'll even set you to rule and reign on the new earth with him. Now, this is a limited time offer. I don't know when it expires. Because you're going to expire either when Christ comes back or when he takes your spirit from you. So it's a limited time offer. I don't know how long it will last. But for now, if you haven't, turn away from your rebellion and turn away from your unbelief and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and be adopted and be forgiven and restored. Don't be like the line of Cain participating in filling the earth with a culture of violence, whether it's through the arts or through your, your labors. But this is where the gospel found us, carrying out the cultural mandate, whether we realized it or not. And sometimes what happens then, this is where I think the wheels start to come off the cart. God saves us, and all of a sudden we're like, okay, what am I supposed to be doing? This radical life change has, has come in, I'm a new creature, new creature, new creation. And so often we've spent so much time in Genesis proving how it's scientifically accurate that we've failed to notice this cultural mandate, that we were created by God to bring everything in creation to the glory of God. We spent so much time on the image of God and the sanctity of life warring against the abortion uh, war, rightfully so, that we fail to realize the whole purpose of the image of God is to subdue this earth and to create God-glorifying culture. And that's what we're still supposed to be doing. And then I think some more misunderstanding comes when the Great Commission comes in. So turn over there for just a minute, and we'll kind of wind things down here. We've seen what the cultural mandate is, We've seen it continues. We've seen it illustrated. You and I were carrying it out when we were converted. And then the Great Commission comes to us. We get to be these ambassadors of Christ. And we read in Matthew 28 uh, the, the words of Christ before He ascends. And we love them and they are glorious. But sometimes they're a little bit misunderstood. Matthew 28 verse 18, Jesus came up and spoke to them. That's the apostles. And he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we get this feeling that we're just biding our time until Christ comes. And as I have opportunity, I need to do missions, whether it's intentional outreach or maybe even be a missionary. But if I'm not doing one of those things, I'm really not doing anything spiritual. That's so often how we think. It's not doing great commission work. If we're not out doing kingdom work, we're just kind of biding our time and everything's ho-hum mundane. But when you get things right, there is no mundane. There is no divide between the sacred and the secular. 
It's not like some of the work you do is secular and doesn't really matter to God, but every once in a while you get to do some special spiritual works for the kingdom. No, it's all spiritual. Because you are a redeemed being. Everything you do is holy. Or should be holy. And so think about this Great Commission. And let me clarify the misunderstanding. Yes, the apostles went out and they spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. Praise the Lord. But follow the logic of what happened. When they went out and people were converted in these different cities across the Roman Empire, did all those people drop what they were doing and go out as missionaries? No. The normal Christian life is staying where you're at and bringing all of your life into conformity with the revealed will of God. Carrying out the cultural mandate in your home and in your workplace. That's what all these early Christians did. They didn't all go out and spread all over the earth. That's not what we see in the book of Acts. Matter of fact, even more specifically, when you think about the letter of Ephesians, the letter of Colossians, the uh, first Peter, all three of those have what we call the household codes. How to live in the first century. Husbands, wives, parents, children, slaves, masters. The idea was that you are going to stay here in this town. And you're going to stay in this family and in this home. And you're going to bring everything into submission to Christ. And you're now going to use your labor, your skills, the, the arts, and you're going to use it all for the glory of Christ. You used to use it for the glory of Satan, but you're going to stay where you are, and you're going to now carry out the cultural mandate right where you are in your relationships, whether they be siblings, whether they be spouses, whether they be parents or children. And then, of course, we get this new family where we get to carry things out. So the reality then is that it's not like we're just biding our time waiting for Christ to come back. No, when we rightly consider that the eternal state will have kings and nations and bringing our glory into the new Jerusalem, I'll tell you what one writer has said, and I'll just tell you, this is pure speculation, but it makes sense. So I do earmark it as pure speculation. But we know that there's no soul sleep for the Christian. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We're going to continue our consciousness. What I've read, and it makes a lot of sense, and I think it's worth considering, is that the skills we have picked up in this life, the, the desires in this life, the good desires, the things we enjoy doing that are pleasing to God and that we've worked at and become proficient at and the things that we want to work at and be proficient at but we haven't had the time to do, we're still going to be in many ways the same person in the new heavens and the new earth. It's not like God's going to zap us and make us not who we were. God's going to keep all of the good and finally we'll be freed from the body of this death. There'll be no more flesh. There'll be no more sin. But there's going to be great continuity with who we are. And some have, have written, and I, I think it's probably right, that all these things we like to do and get to do now and maybe are good at or want to do but don't have the time in the new earth, the new creation, we're going to get to employ those skills, those, those, those labors. We'll be doing all the same type of works but without the creation pushing back without the sin in our bodies polluting everything that we do. And so in many ways, what we're doing now is preparation for what we're going to do in eternity. We're not just biding our time. And we're not doing, oh, merely secular things because we're not out on the mission field. And we don't want to denigrate the mission field. We are still to be about proclaiming the gospel, no doubt. But it doesn't mean we drop everything else. Now, for some it does. But the New Testament expectation is that we continue on with bringing everything in conformity to God. So think back then. Think back then to the very first questions, semi-rhetorical questions at the beginning of the sermon. Can you uh, organize files to the glory of God? Yeah, because God is a God of organization and order. Think back in Genesis, that taxonomical structure. Anytime we organize our files, which I hate doing, anytime we do that, and we're thanking God and seeing that we're made in the image of God and, and behaving like Him and organizing and separating things, we're carrying out the cultural mandate, and you can do that to the glory of God. 
Think about this. Can you wash dishes to the glory of Christ? Of course you can, because as you sit there at the sink, you can realize, wait a minute, God, you gave us the wisdom and the ingenuity to mine your creation, to draw out metals for piping, to engage in studying water and hydrology. And now we've got water pumping through the sink. We can heat it up because men have studied the, the laws of nature. Uh, somehow we've converted creation into dishes. This is, this is amazing. All because of the cultural mandate. Can you walk down the sidewalk to the glory of Christ? Of course you can, because you can walk down the sidewalk and say, wow, Look what you've enabled us to do, God. You've enabled us to draw materials out of the earth and we don't walk in the dirt anymore. We actually have, have pavement, all because of your creation and the wisdom you've given us. This is amazing. Can you turn off the TV to the glory of God? You can. As you, as you are watching, enjoying God-glorifying entertainment and arts, and then God-denying stuff comes on, you can flip it off and say, yeah, I don't want to be a part of the culture of Cain. I don't want to participate in those works. And you can shut off the TV to the glory of Christ. You can flip on the light switch to the glory of Christ as you realize, wow, God, electricity in your creation that you've given man the wisdom to harness. And I get to be a part of that and think about how to use it for your glory. There's nothing in this life that you can't do to the glory of Christ when you realize what God intends for us in the cultural mandate. We can pay our taxes We can fold our laundry. We can pull weeds. You can pull weeds because we understand that God intended to have a beautiful earth. And as we clean it up, yes, it fights back against us, but we're redoing what God originally intended. So, I want to encourage you to go back into Genesis and and study these texts afresh. And then study your own life. As you, as you sit in these pews and realize I'm not sitting on the floor because God gave us materials and we figured out how to use them. And remember then that there's nothing mundane in your life. It may be repetitive, but there's nothing mundane. All of it can be to the glory of Christ as you bring everything into submission to the glory of Christ, looking for the day in which we'll be able to bring things personally to Christ when we see him face to face. Pray with me. Father, I thank you so much that your word is so deep and yet also so clear. Father, what an amazing calling that we have, that we would be able to be stewards of this earth, that it would be in many ways our playground, that we would get to enjoy it and form it and fashion it in ways that glorify you. And as we do so, we then get to tell others, people we used to be, about how not only are you going to reconcile this earth back to yourself, but you're also reconciling people. That you sent your son, the Lord of creation, the second Adam, who's going to totally fix this earth. You sent him to seek and save the lost. What an incredible blessing it is that we get to be both ambassadors of Christ and lords of creation, and to bring it all into submission to you. Father, what a calling that we have. What a joy it is. Father, help us then to have joy in all these little things, recognizing how as we order our lives, we reflect you, the orderly God. As we sort things and differentiate things, we do so to your glory. Father, as we submit ourselves to you, Even that's to your glory, because it's only by your Spirit that we can submit ourselves to you, much less all the rest of creation. So, Father, we ask then for your grace. Would you be gracious to us by your Spirit, so that we would not be hearers only, but doers? That is our heart's desire, to be doers of your Word. But we can only do this by your power. So, Father, be gracious to us by your Spirit, for the glory of your Son. Make us doers this morning, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.